last panel before lunch, but it's uh, an important panel and one that has uh, captured some of the trends which we saw in the media leader uh, debate first thing this morning. And I have uh, two illustrious advertisers, uh, heads, of, heads of media of two of Britain's biggest advertisers in Gail Noah and Bab Patel from Sky and L'Oreal. And we also have Lisa from Pubmatic to uh, represent the, uh, the future-facing world of media in which we all have to live today. So uh, I would like some audience interaction, please. We've, we've had lots this morning. So think of the questions you'd like to ask the panel or indeed, yeah. Uh, and I will, if you do ask a question, please say who you are and where you're from. I will channel my best Scylla Black to make you do that for those in a certain age. And please do keep it to a question, not a speech. <laughs> Um, right, let's get on with the, uh, the uh, debate. I, I thought we'd start with optimism because uh, I'm just back from a holiday, so I'm optimistic, and I, I came back and found that, yeah, most of the UK wasn't being optimistic about a number of things. We're, we're probably all in budget-setting mode for 2023 now, um, and yeah, I'd like to know all three of you will have yeah, budgets that yeah, you're setting and yeah, teams that you're, you're setting too. So... so what, what, what products are you yeah, going to find interesting in 2023? What are your, yeah, what are your growth, what is your growth coalition for, for next year? Perhaps, perhaps we can start with you, Bav. What, what is Sky going to give us that's going to be optimistic for, for next year? I don't think the answer is going to be quite optimistic, Greg. Um, look, I think, we, I think we have to be, all be honest. Next year is going to be pretty tough. You know, you know advertising follows the recession. Um, so I think um, fighting the good fights easy, well, hard, but you know, sometimes it is easier as a marketeer, trying to protect your marketing budgets. But I think next year's going to be quite tough. And I think many advertisers will be looking at the, the ongoing recession, the choppy waters, especially in the next two quarters, all the uncertainty, and thinking about what that means for their budgets and how they, how they best adapt, to be honest. I think there's... There's three probably trends that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about, I'm sure I've had the times I'm thinking about. Number one um, is around brand um, and actually how do we protect brand spend. And I think it's, it's easier now than it was four, five, six years ago. I think with the pandemic in the last couple of years and you know, the sort of data we've got, upper funnel metrics and things like share of voice, share of market, we've seen what happens when you don't spend on brand advertising for a, a bad period. So I think although you know, in terms of the C-suites, they'll be wanted to focus on short-term, uh, focusing on in-year revenue. I think that debate about protecting brand investment would be easier this year. Yeah. Um, well, I immediately talked about 2023, and you talked about the next two quarters. So um, well, I remember, I, I remember uh, Dags, next, Dags at ITV said, I said, how's your year, Dags? And he said, it's down to Q4, Greg. It's always down to Q4. <laughs> no, and I'm it, actually, when I, when I say next two quarters, I'm already talking about 23, quarter right, one, so quarter two. one and two. To clarify. Four, Q4 is done, yeah. Q, Q, quarter four is done. Easy. Well, to Smashed extent. it, yeah. 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 It depends on what Harry Kane does, but let's see. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, in terms of the next quarter, we're talking about 23. And I think brand advertising will be protected. Um, the second area, and something I'm exploring, and for me, Joe's in the room, it'll be interesting how you, how you work for this, is flexibility. Because again, we're going to need flexibility. I think you know, that, that, that period is going to offer both opportunities and, and risks, depending on what categories you're in. And actually, advertisers like, like us are going to want to increase spend poor spend or decreased spend in real time. So actually working with media owners and our agency partners to work at how we create frameworks um, that allow us to do that, allows that agility, um, I think will be um, increasingly important. I had a third one, which I completely forgot. So well, we'll, we'll, we'll move on then. We'll, we'll move on. Go, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll think of it Gail, in a Gail, I'll come back to you because I'm sure you've got some... Lisa, you're, you're running a, a, different, a different type of business. What... what what optimistic trends can you offer for 2023, if any? Yeah, I mean, I think what you said exactly is being flexible, being nimble is so important because if you set the strategy and you're forced into something, then you have to then, you can't look at the environment and see how things change. But I think a lot of it goes from, from a pomatic business perspective, that's kind of our ethos, but from how we work with our partners because we kind of sit in the middle of the programmatic eco space and so rely on media owners and also brands and agencies yeah. and 
uh, demand side platforms. So we have to look at the kind of the whole ecosystem and work with everyone. Yeah, but but as a, as a yeah ad tech as an ad tech provider, yeah. okay, are your uh, and having you know, worked with a number of those businesses over the year, yeah. presumably you're still looking at large growth targets for next year. Yeah, and I think that uncertainty is where programmatic succeeds is because you don't have to forecast years in advance and kind of you can you can call us and be like I need to run this campaign tomorrow and that's that's kind of the bread and butter that programmatic has been really successful in you know during the pandemic it was where a lot of people are sitting at home they're on their screens CTV went through the roof much faster than anyone thought it would because that's where the industry moved to and that's where the adoption moved to so being able to be nimble and react quickly instead of having um, you know, the old school media way where, oh, we're at the upfronts and things like that. Having that flexibility is where I think programmatic really succeeds well with. So as a, as a business, you're optimistic? I, I think we, we all have as to be. As a person, you're, as, are you half full? <laughs> Being American, I do try to be <laughs> yeah. more optimistic yeah, than we'll, some, we'll, but my we'll, team might we'll say otherwise. You stay here long enough, we'll knock that yeah. out. We'll, we'll, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been here for six years, so <laughs> I've, uh, I've seen the doom and gloom of the weather. Yeah. Gail. Give, give us what well, L'Oreal, very good long term advertiser, very good brand advertiser. Have you got any interesting you know, products that you're launching next year that you're going to be spending you know, behind? Or, oh, what? Oh, what? Oh. <laughs> um, I would say, as L'Oreal, we're cautiously optimistic about next year. So we've got a lot of extra costs within our supply chain, which is obviously going to have an effect. And with media being the largest part of our PL, that is obviously going to have a knock on. However, what we're having to do is obviously then make choices because we do see media as fuel for growth. So we will continue to invest, same as we've done in every recession. Um, we continue spending behind our brands. It's making the choices between awareness and transactional um, and trying to also understand how do we play the market with other forces that are coming in, such as media inflation. So we are having to make some bold choices, but we will continue to invest. So let's go, we'll, we'll save the inflation for the next question. But okay, so in terms of yeah, you're still yeah looking for at a at a, a twelve month yeah, you know, yeah schematic in the, in the middle and planning planning sensibly into into the long term. There's no yeah absolutely. There's no I mean, all the black clouds of yeah, energy prices, cost of we heard about it, cost of living crisis, war there in Ukraine. There are always costs coming to the supply chain. However, then you, you find that the you know people always want beauty. They always want beauty products. So but they will start to shop slightly differently. And equally as a brand we need to offer more value. So it's things using things like beauty tech and services and how do we add value to so make sure that when they're spending money they are making the right choices first time. So it's how can we add value as a brand to all of our different customers. Okay. And you've, you've been at yeah, L'Oreal for a number of years now. Again, the, the, uh, the shift from, uh, like he's talking about that, yeah, eight week AB deadlines and yeah, t yeah, I saw Jamie Journey from Ghana go, yeah, booking those outside back covers 12 months in advance. I mean, how, how much of your, your media spend now is, is being flexible versus yeah getting yeah a secure lot. a lot so we obviously when i started i've been there 12 and a half years so i think you know it was very much about my magazine running order and it was very much getting my eight week booking deadline and i think covid really accelerated that and actually we wanted to be much more reactive to what was happening in the business um, which categories people were buying or not buying as the salons were shut and you know sort of people couldn't go into into stores and so that really accelerated our demand for agility and actually being able to move that money, certainly across different channels to different providers who were giving us that flexibility. And I don't think that demand has stopped. So we still require that agility and being closer to the business performance. So I don't think we're gonna go back to those old days of yeah. I'm, I need to commit my money three months out. That is super difficult for a business to do now. Yeah. Okay, so on stage I've got three people who are optimistic about 2023. Uh, let's have a, a quick old-fashioned poll. I don't have one of uh, Sam Tidmarsh's yeah, flashy slidos here, but yeah, let's have a hands up. If your business expects to grow in 2023, put your hand up. Okay, for those that didn't put their hand up, I suggest you start looking for a new job. <laughs> 
Um, right, I, I, I kept you away from Q4 earlier, about, but I'll take you back to Q4. Let's go back to quarter four, shall we? Yeah, Q4. Now, uh, Omar and his uh, media leader column this week talked about TV inflation and the World Cup and planning strategies around the World Cup. Yeah, perhaps, yeah, again, what, what's, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, again, Sky, obviously, yeah, don't have yeah, World Cup yeah, coverage. So, yeah, yeah. Does, that, does that mean it's an advantage for you as an advertiser or...? I think first I'll talk about back in sort of March, April, when we started talking about quarter four and this inflation that was rising and this Armageddon of inflation that was going to cause chaos. I was actually quite proud of advertisers. I think we actually, we get quite savvy in terms of knowing how we're going to spend and actually what we're willing to spend on things like World Cup and the sort of packages that are available. And actually, based on what we saw sort of April, May, the inflation is not as high. It's still high, but it's not as high as what I was being told it was going to be. I mean, October is... It, it's fine, there or thereabouts. I think also ITV came back with more palatable World Cup packages that incentivise advertisers to get in. Um, and again, I've said it already, depends on how far Harry Kane and his chums get in, into the World Cup. But I'm, I'm the eternal optimist, hopefully he does, but if he doesn't, then, then obviously we've saved some inflation there. Um, so yeah, look, I, you know, we'll, we'll work around the World Cup, you know, there's, you know, in terms of our breadth of products. It's, it's just another bump in the road. For you. It's another bump in the road. We've got breadth of products that, you know, attract those audiences, but there's, there are other places where we can find those audiences. Okay, okay, okay. What, what, have you got specific plans? Have you got specific you know, products that you're promoting within that period or are you avoiding it for any reason? Q4 is always huge for us. So certainly sort of the fragrance and gifting um, areas, Q4 is massive. Um, but we've been dealing with inflation now for a couple of years mm -hmm. and we've had to find some alternative strategies on how we mitigate that. So we've made some quite bold choices this year. So we've been working with a company called Audience Project, who I think are on the other stage. Yes, yeah. um, and looking at um, some of our cross-video reach in the absence of any origin yet. Um, so we've been working with them to look at, and with Essence, to look at the cross-video reach across TV, BVOD, YouTube and Facebook and to really see actually can we deliver the same level of reach taking money out of TV, not killing it, but reducing it, um, to see whether we can still deliver the same weight of communication without impacting sales. And really interestingly, we did five pilots across the summer, all of which had significant sales growth. So it gives us quite a lot of confidence that while we still maintain TV, actually we can mitigate some of that inflationary effect um, by moving into money into other channels. So, you know, while reach is only one aspect of it, and it's, you know, there are lots of other metrics to start having a look at, it's a really interesting way, and one that we will probably continue as we go into 23. How can we mitigate some of those inflationary effects with the decline of linear audiences aren't going to go away? Yeah. Okay, Lisa, your C uh, CTVs are right in your yeah, sweet spot. Okay, you got any... Uh, uh, case studies that you could talk about, about what, someone who's done something different yeah, and had a success because of it? Yeah, I mean, I think exactly to your point, we've seen a number of advertisers and agencies kind of look at what they're doing from a linear perspective as TV continues to be kind of the billion dollar elephant and moving that money into digital, into programmatic and how the success of that, because you can measure so much more when it comes to that and have so much more flexibility. And so I think it, it goes back to how are we gonna be nimble and how are we gonna be able to diversify? But also I think to your point is that um, not everyone's gonna be watching the World Cup. So how do you find the other audiences? Because this Q4 is so unique that it's also Christmas, which is the big, you know, Black Friday has grown in the UK drastically and the run up to Christmas, that's where all the media budgets get focused on and spent. So how do you diversify, not just going for that World Cup audience, but looking at, you know, there's obviously a large subset who won't be watching the World yeah, Cup. And you've got an EMEA uh, remit. Again, yeah. are there, uh, how does the UK, again, most, most, hands up if you're not working in the UK. Yeah, okay, yeah. Couple, okay, so you've got mainly a UK audience here. So are there, are there markets that, you know, that, that these guys should be looking at who are doing, doing things better than the UK? Or is, is the, where, where is the UK within your, within your region? Are we, are we yeah, uh, early adopters? Are we leaders? Where are we? Yeah, I think just from a programmatic perspective, the US tends to, the industry, the US tends to do things their own way. And then uh, probably Canada and the UK follow probably about six to 12 months behind that. 
and then it gets spread out to Europe. Apex kind of the wild, wild west and does whatever they want to do because they have that flexibility and they're a very different environment in the fact that a lot of it is mobile first. Um, but from an EMEA perspective, and unlike most other Americans who think that EMEA is just one country, um, <laughs> you, you can't, you, we look at obviously the UK because we speak the same language, but uh, different countries will say they're very unique in their, in their planning and how they do things. Um, a lot of the publishers across Germany, for instance, own their own infrastructure. So they have a, more control than, say, in the UK. But it's looking at which, you asked me which markets are doing things that are forward. I think UK definitely looks at things differently and is unique in the sense that we do try to be uh, forward in thinking and planning. And then the likes of Germany are probably about six months behind that and then Southern Europe. Uh, but if you've got a European role these days, what, uh, yeah, what do you see? What are these differences do you see um, that perhaps the UK could learn from? That, you know, or, or are we still just the best at everything? Yeah, it's almost a little bit arrogant when I go to the markets and I talk about what we do in the UK compared to what they do. But no, I think there is. It's, it is mainly what we do is taking UK as a blueprint and trying to adopt that in, in sort of Germany and Italy, which are the sort of main markets that we sort of that we sort of in. But we've just launched Sky Glass in Italy and actually. Like the digital ecosystem they built for Sky Glass is brilliant compared to what we were able to do in the UK, mainly because they took a lot of the learnings from the UK and were able to sort of build the sort of infrastructure and that sort of capability. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, we tend to see mainly UK strategy, uh, best practice being adhered to consistently across Europe. Okay. But, um, sort of related, the, uh, the SVOD debate, we um, are... You know, media leader's sister title video and it covers a lot on yeah, SVOD and Ava. Obviously, the big announcement this week of uh, Netflix and Disney Plus going on, going on to Bob. Yeah, does that leave you excited, nonplussed? Yeah, knew it was coming anyway. Yeah, Gail, Gail, do you want to start? Um, I'm super excited by the announcement. I'd love it to extend when they go to the advertising to make sure that that's being captured rather than just the programming. Um, but I think, you know, they've gone to market. I would say it's not quite quite where advertisers need it to be. I think you know the measurement piece is not there yet, the targeting capabilities aren't there yet. So I think there's still a bit of work to do, but again, we don't know who the audience is going to be, you know, who's going to be signing up for the ad subscription layer, um, but we, you know, we're a huge video advertiser, so we would love to be there. I've not seen a media pack yet. I've just seen, I've just seen an email. A media pack. I'm, 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 I'm not seeing a media I'm pack. I'm old school. Either. I'm really old school. I want to see a media pack. I've not seen any sort of firm details. Yeah, if you look um, on Brad, which we own, you'll find it. Yeah. Um, I've seen, I've seen some snippets and obviously sort of information. To Gail's point, there are, there's a lot of work to be done. They've clearly sort of rushed a little bit, wanted to make sure they're out there and sort of talk about it. I've heard things about minimum commitments across Europe, which is quite tough when you don't know what audiences you're buying. I mean, ultimately, I don't think I want my, my Sky Dollars anyway, to be fair, given uh, a lot of the stuff that I would like to advertise on there, I don't think they would like me to. So, um, so yeah, you've we'll not had those conversations yet? No, not those conversations. No. But again, look, Netflix, you know, they're, they're, a, they're a big partner of ours. Um, and obviously, there are there are products we sell that are they're beneficial to Netflix. But, you know, I'm talking about things like our Sky Originals, for example. I don't think they'll be best pleased putting that in the middle of the crown. Um, so, yeah, we, 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 we hope. Yeah, and, and Spotify is probably an example where I'm a, I remember being at a conference once where someone said, yeah, the only people I want to advertise on Spotify are the people that pay the subscription that I can't advertise to. So, yeah, yeah it, again, to your point, Gav, do you think that's going to be a problem for those streamers? So that those that can afford to pay yeah, will avoid advertising. I think HBO famously, and Lisa perhaps can get a US perspective on that, HBO being ad-free, attracted a very affluent audience. Mm -hmm. So is this going to be a, a problem for the streaming service? I don't think so. I mean, if you look at Spotify, some of our best campaigns are on Spotify on the, on the, on the free. So I'm not... Best as in best performing? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not concerned about who's actually signing up for the ad targeted. I think, obviously, you've got a squeeze coming next year. Yeah. I think people are going to be looking at their subscriptions. It probably will be a certain type of household that downgrades... Um, I think, you know, are, is it going to generate new subscriptions? Who knows? Um, but I think it's interesting. I think until we start getting the data of who these people are, mm -hmm. for me, I wouldn't discount any, anybody on this because I think everyone for us, we have products that are suitable for everybody. So there's always, you know, there'll be some products that aren't necessarily the right environment. But 
we'll see. But I'm, I'm not worried about it being a Spotify model. Right. Okay, Lisa, again, you, you, as you say, the Americans are ahead of us. Well, I think. Not sure on yeah, not sure on soccer yet, but yeah, 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 you're, you're <laughs> welcome. Um, that HBO thing I talked about, and again, that subscription is, is there. Can you give us a state size perspective on on whether you think that the, the Avod services are going to be yeah, successful, unsuccessful? How does that fit in with your ecosystem? Um, I would say, from a U.S. perspective, it's, that would be my personal opinion and not a pragmatic stance. So right. I'll add that disclaimer okay, in. Yeah. But for I the mean, record, yeah. I, th I think it is all exciting. It's innovation. It's you know the industry is moving forward. It will. We will then, as an industry, have to tackle things like targeting and audience and all of that. Um, HBO years ago came out. I think Sex in the City was what really pushed HBO forward, and then shows like Game of Thrones, and they really um, took everything forward and started competing with the networks. And then kind of Netflix and Amazon came in and started competing with the likes of HBO. So HBO had a very, as you said, affluent audience. And with launching HBO Max is where kind of their subscription, their, their digital subscription solution is. They continue to do that. And they're kind of like, this is what we're doing. We're not going to diversify from that. Um, and I, But I think like we have to constantly look for new audiences and how to reach additional consumers, people who, who can't afford to pay or who, are, who, don't, who enjoy advertising and don't feel the need to do the subscription model. So I think it, it's exciting. Like, it, it is pushing that innovation even further and will push all of us further. Yeah, I like that. Enjoy advertising. It used to be a, to be a TGI question, which was I enjoy <laughs> advertising more than the programming, which uh, you know, went down over the years. But yeah, I, I, I got into advertising because I enjoyed advertising. I wonder whether... People are doing the same today, the talent crisis. Um, anyone got any questions? There's 15 minutes left in this session. Anyone got a question for the panel now they'd like to ask? No? OK, I'll be coming back to you shortly then. I have lots more, lots more questions. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll start a debate here. I think you're both, you're both with the same media agency, aren't you, which is a bit annoying. Yeah. Media group. Media yes. group. OK, agencies, and again, yeah, I'm a proud supporter of agencies, having spent most of my, well, apart from my media tell years, it's all been, all been agency. They're great at pushing new things. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes they push things that they are told to push rather than, exactly. yeah, yeah, want to push. But I think most media planners will, will, will put, again, uh, Spotify or Avod would be you know, those sort of things. Have you got um, some examples of something where yeah, you've, you've seen something coming, an, an agency initiative that you think is going to really take off. So something that your agency has given you yeah, first, and Lisa, I'll give you a slightly different yeah, spin on this question, but yeah, maybe, yeah, Gail. Yeah, you, yeah I think, you know, the audience project and piece of work that we did came out of a conversation that they were trying to tinker with, they were playing with, and like, do you fancy trying it? I was like, oh yeah, um, let's give it a go. And so I think, you know... Uh, and that, that came from the agency? That came from the agency. Yeah. And it was a, you know, we're struggling with inflation. We've got an idea. It's just like a seed of an idea. Do you fancy trying it? I was like, yes, let's go. You know, we're a big believer in innovation. We have innovation pots. We like, so we're really pushing for, for trying new things and expanding how we operate in media. I think there is a danger that, you know, sort of agencies can come up with the next shiny new toy. And I think actually where Essence are very good is actually they align it very much with our strategic objectives. So, for example, if it's about pushing towards how we operate with data, whether it's 1P data, how we operate with retailers in the new 2P space, um, I think, you know, they're actually very good at aligning, and I think that's where a partnership works really well, is where they understand the business, and they're not necessarily trying to sell you something, their new product, but they also are quite aware that I don't necessarily buy into those. <laughs> so, <laughs> they don't, I think it's a waste of their time. <laughs> Anyone from Essence in the room who doesn't work on L'Oreal? <laughs> So, yeah, Bav, what, what, what's, uh, what's the... So what, we, okay, give, us, give us an example of something that you turned down. Oh, yeah, a great idea that you turned down from Mediacom. Well, let me just or, give a bit of a history, actually, because last year we, re, we renegotiated our contract with Mediacom. We signed them on for another three years. It's been a 10-year-plus relationship with them. We're absolutely delighted to have done that. But at the same time, we've consolidated all of our digital across Europe into, into Mediacom. So in Italy, we're with um, Dentsu, we consolidated that into, into Mediacom. And in, and in UK... All of our PPC programmatic that we did in house, we also gave that to MediaCom and their, and their Google practice, in, in, um, which is operating from up north. The reason why we did that was obviously we wanted consistency, especially across sort of digital. Um, 
And the, the plan, the vision they've got from us is you know, how do we deliver that perform bit, you know, the brilliant basics, and how do they transform us? So how do they make sort of future proof of the next sort of two, three years? Um, so we're at the beginning of that journey. I mean, they, they, they're constantly coming to us with new tools, like Creative Analytics is a new product that they've, that they've, um, they've brought to market, and we're, and we're working with them. We've tested it in, in UK and Italy, and the results have been fantastic. And look, to Gail's point, they're always going to have products that are commercially viable for them, uh, and they're going to approach advertisers, but that's always going to happen. I'll provide you always lead with the strategy first. I, I, I think you can always get to a point where you, know, you can always deliver efficiency and, and effectiveness um, and ultimately measure anything that they, they do for us. So, you know, again, they're a business. They want to deliver revenue, they want to deliver profit, and it's actually for developing products. You know, I'm not just all blind to say, right, I'm not going to do it because you can't be agency and me doing that. But let's try it, let's test it, let's see if it works. But underpinning all of that is I always feel like they're going to do something strategic right. And do, do you, again, I, I always had it on my program. Yeah, remember you work for the agency, not for the client. That was a classic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is a bit of that. Yeah. Um, uh, and come my team are here. They're, they're probably, <laughs> right, they probably yeah. have more but, direct conversations. You, you, uh, 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 collaboration was one of the, the, the things earlier. You, you still think you're both getting great correlation? Absolutely, getting, both, brilliant. Yeah. Both big supporters of the current agency you're sure. with. I mean, you quickly, you could, the, the tail quickly tells. Yeah. If, you, if you're not collaborative, if it's not open and trustworthy relationship, you're not collaborating, you, it just quickly sort of collapses. Yeah. It's nice to hear. And I, I think also agencies are having to do a hell of a lot more than they've ever had to do before. Yeah. And be paid less for it. Yeah. Well, Absolutely I'll not. <laughs> <laughs> they keep coming with the basket, you know, yeah. what's more. <laughs> um, but I think it's like, you know, it's getting more and more complex and we're not stopping things, we're adding more things in. So there are more platforms, more ways to communicate, and we're, so we're asking for more and more and more. So they're being spread increasingly thin. So it's, it's a challenge for them at the moment. Uh, Lisa, let's say okay, you talked to earlier about your know, agencies are part of your partner. Do you, can you call out any of the, any anyone who's doing it particularly well? Feel free to call out someone who's doing it badly as well if you're feeling brave. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so have you done so any initiatives with any of the you know, uh, groups or you know, yeah? I mean, agencies? we do have global partnerships with the likes of Group M um, and Dentsu, for instance. So those are kind of the public ones, and I think that it's about innovation and being able to build on that partnership. So both of you guys talked a lot about those two kind of key words and being able to be that trusted partner. So I think that's where we've seen um, the agencies be successful is that kind of because we sit in the middle of everything, we look at it from an education perspective. So how can we then arm your agencies to then go speak with you yeah. about kind of the latest innovation and the industry trends? Because I think that our unique industry moves so quickly. And just when you think you have one piece of the pie understood, there's 20 new initiatives and 20 new products. So how do we keep up that education piece? Because there's a lot of new players that come into this space. They there's times where those players will go directly to the brands and start fear-mongering because what you don't know, you fear. Um, and so how do we make sure that we arm everyone in the ecosystem with that information to make sure that we're all successful and we're all pushing for that transparency and that trust? Because that's what those are the foundation layers for everything. Yeah. OK. Anyone got a question for me? Or you all been, yeah, all right. There's a. A uh, chap at the uh, back of uh, his hands up who's going to ask a question and not give us a speech. Thank you, Bob. Bob <laughs> Wooten, media leader, columnist, esteemed over many years. Thank you. Um, I hope maybe one person left in the room will talk to me after this question. Oh, God. Um, given that the topic of this conversation is budget trends, uh, and given what we now are learning with exponential speed about what's happening in the social media and all the misdemeanors there. Everything from, you know, imp uh, implication of social channels in fatalities. My latest scare, which is I don't even have TikTok installed on my devices and yet it can scrape me. These kind of things. I just wonder, the question for the two biggest advertisers in the UK and other big advertisers in the room, talking about budget trends, why would you spend any money at all? looking forwards in those channels, given that they are now such discredited and scary environments? It's a big question, sorry. Right. So, thank you, Bob. Uh, again, it's good. So <laughs> why would you spend any money, yeah, with people that you don't trust? And again, we, we had... So, and let's... Yeah, yeah the, the, the tech duopoly, yeah, 
are trusted by many people, they're yeah. trusted by many consumers, and but we see, and we write about it quite a lot, again, and it's, I, I get Mark Howe tells me off every week, every time Bob or Ray Snoddy or someone says something like, he's like, yeah, well, what about the Daily Mail? What about, yeah, ITV? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, would you, you'd end up spending no money with anyone if that was the case, would, would you? Or, yeah. Potentially, and I think it is about being around uh, content that is suitable. Um, regardless of the platform. So I think, you know, again, we, we don't advertise to children. Um, we are adults advertising. And again, it's being in the right place for the right consumer with the right message. But it's, again, making sure that we're in content that's suitable. So, you know, sort of it's uh, where do you draw the line between which platforms do you advertise on and which ones don't? So we were always requested to avoid the Daily Mail. You know, we were always asked, you know, we always got bombarded in our corp comms department. Why are you advertising the Daily Mail? It's like, well, where do you draw the line? You might not agree with your point of view, but actually quite a lot of people in the UK think that that is quite a suitable place. Mm. So I think there is a limit of where do you draw the line. Yeah. And so, again, if, if you, have you got within your corporate comms department places where you are, like, uh, and a blacklist, uh, um, Breitbart, I remember my agency, Breitbart was always one in the States where we, you know, just every advertiser would go, do not advertise on Breitbart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you, you, have you got a long list or are, are there any... We do, are there we, any do, we do have a list, but it's more around the content as opposed to specific platforms, but... Yeah. And how about something like GB News? We have not advertised on there. For, is that a... We, is that that a, was a decision we took right at the very beginning when from they launched. From CEO level or, yeah? It was a local level. At local level, yeah. yeah. Bab, what, what, what's your... Yeah, I think yeah, from you've got 10 million customers in the UK, right, and there's many more millions of prospects, and they, they're, they're a diverse bunch, and they'll be consuming a range of different media channels, um, media owners. I mean, to Gal's point, where do you stop? Um, the the cop-out answer is not... But the only thing you can do is push them for regulation. And that's what we try to do from within. That's what industry bodies try to do. And there's many sort of boards now available uh, are, are set up with, you know, with, with clients who are out there sort of pushing for change, ensuring that they're trying to keep them honest and sort of regulated. That's as much as we can do. And obviously, again, internally, is having that blacklist, having working with our agency partners to ensure that we're not around any content that we, we deem not suitable. Okay. He's going to feel like he's a cop out answer. It's, yeah, they're still going to spend money, Bob. Yeah, uh, as, you, as, you, as you would expect, and as hopefully everyone in this room is, is, is playing, is it? And again, I think yeah, Jimmy News is going. So you're probably advertising on Talk TV, Murdoch owned. No, you're not? No, okay. Uh, I, I do find that, that an interesting one that yeah, the, uh, I had Angelos on the phone going, yeah, we're, the, we're just the smallest kid in the playground. People pick on us, but we're, they're still advertising. Yeah, Google, Facebook, Daily Mail, Rupert Murdoch. Any more? Yes, at the back there. Name, uh, who are you and where do you come from, please? Uh, my name's James, I work at The Guardian. Um, just building on that last question, isn't there a difference between um, disagreeing with an editorial policy and funding a business model where, you know, I think we, we can say it, that, um, you know, we're talking about uh, a girl taking her life because of content, you know, a coroner has said in a report, um, a girl committed suicide because of content she was targeted with because of a, a business model and algorithms. So I think that's a bit different to supporting, you know, you don't fund hate, daily mail. So, so the, question, the question is, without yeah, putting words in your mouth because we're running out of time, yeah. but I'm going to put a question. Sorry. It's the, yeah, are you, yeah. You can't, so arguably, and uh, it's a difficult position to be put in, but arguably you could do more, you could defund. Those audience exists elsewhere and uh, you could defund <laughs> certain platforms. Where yeah. do you stand on that? So let, let's, it's, a, it's, it's Bob's question in a slightly different way. So, yeah, and I'll ask, again, you two, again, apologies, Lisa, because, again, it, it's, the, it's the advertisers here. Are there C-suite conversations within either Sky or L'Oreal which are talking about taking, yeah, all of your money out of those tech platforms? We wouldn't be we wouldn't be having a conversation about removing all of the um, moving all of the money out of a platform. However, at a global level, there'll be pressure put on to make sure that the algorithms are you know suitable for the audiences. And so I think that's where you know sort of you can exert your pressure mm. by being in and being an advertiser of influence mm. right, once you're inside it, as opposed to just withholding. So I think that's where we would be. We're more about trying to influence their policy. At sort of that. Their famous global client council level. Exactly. Yeah. It's strength in numbers. 
then advertisers have to stick together when things like that happen, which is outrageous. But you know, it's how do you how do you fight from within to make sure that they they regulate and they have the, the high level of accountability that as a human we expect. Okay, we start. Uh, sorry. No, it's just a very quick question. It's about budget trends. Uh, I'm launching a business in the UK. Sorry, who are you? I'm, I'm Adam from uh, Affinity Global. Um, I did it 12 years ago. Um, currently, it's, it's, it'd be a lot harder. I'm interested to see things. Like, you mentioned innovation, um, Gail, but it's interesting that this week at IAB, they're doing the upfronts for the likes of Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, for TikTok, um, and for Twitter. Um, it's an 80 20 rule in media spend. To what extent do you think that um, digital media is becoming, is, is, is following old trends of becoming, just following the biggest players in the market and being closed, closed to innovation? Okay, thank you. Lisa, let's, you talked about flexibility and, and the fact that yeah, programmatic wasn't like old media. Can you reassure Adam and everyone else in the room that, yeah, your business is, is the future rather than going back to, as you, I, I saw that, IV up front stuff. Again, is that, is that just a sideshow compared to the flexibility that Gail talked about? I think it's, I don't think it's either or. I think it's everything. So it's being able to support kind of what the agencies and the brands are doing and being able to be flexible with that. So if the IAB is doing the upfronts, they're trying to be kind of open-minded and, and welcoming to to the new, the new players in the game as well as kind of the old players in the game and how do you support everyone as an industry. And I think, and, and I think that we, as a business, just focus on that flexibility and being able to educate but also kind of take people on the journey of what they're looking to do and the end goal that they're trying to achieve. So the metrics that Gail's looking for that she may not have be able to do with terrestrial TV uh, or linear TV and being able to support that kind of from an omni-channel perspective. Okay, thanks. Right, we've, we've shot with out of time. I'll, I'll then give you a, what, one word, one word ago. Yeah, about 2023, better or worse than 2022? I hope for everybody it's better. Gail? Yeah, I hope for better. Different. Different. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking you. Thank you. Thank you.